Hello everyone and welcome back to Teching TV. Tonight we have a special documentary on the One Piece Admirals. We all know about them, strong pillars of the Marines that hold up the entire organization. But where are they now? They've fallen on some hard times, let me tell you. So we're going to first look at Akainu. Akainu Sakazuki, he used to be the Fleet Admiral, he used to have it all. And now he's sleeping behind a 7-Eleven begging for change, you know, it's, it's a rough time for all the admirals okay so so now th this video is we're gonna talk about like where the admirals are at like geographically like what they're doing right now what their goals are where they might be heading you know what they're involved with you know that that's the point of the video but you know it's like where are they now? It's, it's like a, you know, a documentary on like some musician from the 80s that no one's heard of in like 40 years. And it's like, what are, what are they up to? And it's like, uh, often or not, it's just like, yeah, they just quit. They retired and now they're living a happy life. It's, it's weird, right? Uh, but that is actually interesting to think about because the Marines are going to be heavily overhauled by the end of the story. So there might not be a job left for Akainu after this is all said and done. There's definitely not going to be a job left for Green Bull. So he might be the one on hardest times out of all of it. I, I think Fujitora might be okay. Fujitora, maybe maybe after everything is said and done and maybe the government changes, the Tenderabito system is abolished after Dragon's Revolution, after all that, uh, maybe uh, Aokiji will come back into the fold. He'll just be like, oh, okay, the system, it's a whole different system now, so I'll, I'll rejoin, and you know, maybe Aokiji will be the new fleet admiral or something, I don't know. And then Kizaru, Kizaru is the wild card, man, you really don't know what's gonna be up with him. Uh, let's start with Kizaru, because he's gonna be the simplest one, because he's actually involved in the current arc of the story. He's fighting the main character of the manga, okay? So yeah, Kizaru right now, he's at Egghead, he was, uh, brought there alongside St. J. Garcia Saturn and a slew of marine battles battleships and vice admirals ready to wreck Vegapunk's collective shit because you know there's more than one Vegapunk so it's like collective you know what I mean now um where's this gonna go I mean I've made a lot of videos about this already about you know Luffy fighting Kizaru itself uh you know so I'm not gonna go into like the details of the actual fight um but like suffice to say I I don't think it's going to end with Luffy like beating Kizaru down definitively you know like not even like because obviously Luffy doesn't really kill his opponents um, still kind of on the fence of whether or not Kaido is dead or not, but, um, you know, typically Luffy doesn't like to do that, but I'm not even talking about, like, in the way of, like, Luffy just punching out Kizaru with a giant fist, and Kizaru hits the ground, and he loses consciousness, and everybody's like, you know, Kizaru was beat! You know, I, I don't even know if it's gonna go that far. It, it literally might get to a point where they just escape the island, um, and Kizaru is distracted, so he can't immediately pursue them by some other kind of factor. Uh, maybe some of the Vegapunk staying behind. I'm not really sure. Maybe Stussy stays behind. Maybe some other group, you know, Blackbeard is there, Katarina Davon and Lafitte. It might be a thing where, like, Kizaru is, like, all ready to chase after the Straw Hats. Like, the, the Straw Hats get in the ship and they fly away and it's like, oh, you can't escape from me. If you think you can run from me, you really have not learned your lesson yet. I'm made of light. So he goes to attack and then, boom, Katarina Davon and boom, Lafitte show up and it's like we've hypnotized all the Marines and Katarina Davon's taken the form of Saint Jay Garcia or something, and then Kizaru's like, okay, I have to deal with this now. <laughs> I have to deal with this now. Or, I mean, with the timelines on how it's all up and everything like that, like, we don't really know, like, Blackbeard had the whole deal with Law, but, you know, it's been a couple days since then, I think, so it's possible Blackbeard might have went straight from Wiener Island all the way to Egghead, because they're all relatively, it's like Elbaf, Wiener Island, and Egghead were the three that get, you know, pointed to by the log post right after Wano, right? So, Blackbeard might have headed back to Hachinosu to deal with the whole Aokiji Garp situation, or he might have just been like, hey, say ha ha, well, I couldn't get my hands on Law's Devil Fruit, that sucks. Alright, what else can we do? Well, we go to Egghead, let's see what's going on. On there. Oh, wow, this is crazy. All right. So, oh, Blackbeard. You know what? I made a video about this years ago. Blackbeard versus Kizaru. Light versus dark. Not something that's ever really been, like, established. Like, Kizaru and Blackbeard have never really had, like, a moment where it's like, we are destined to fight. But, um, it, it was mentioned, kind of. Remember back when, um, you know, Blackbeard was fighting Ace at Bonaro Island, and Blackbeard was like, you know, ah, yes, darkness drags in everything. Lightning, fire, even light itself. So it's like, ooh, okay. And so I, I 
I did a video about that already. I remember doing that. That was a fun one. But, um, you know, Blackbeard, you know, encountering Kizaru, that that would definitely be like Kizaru is about ready to chase after the Straw Hats. He's about to chase after one of the Yonko. And then, the like, what would stop Kizaru from immediately pursuing them to the ends of the Earth? Either he would have to be defeated definitively or knocked out by Luffy, which I don't think is going to happen, uh, or something else with even more importance, a more portentous situation would have to arrive at Kizaru's doorstep for him to be like, all right, I can't focus on this anymore. I need to focus on this. It could be St. J. Garcia Saturn about to be killed himself. It could be like a danger befalling a Garose. So that distracts him. He has to go deal with that. Or it could be, you know, another Yonko showing up, you know, and it's probably not going to be Shanks. You know, Sh Shanks' role in the story is now just to show up to distract other powerful people so Luffy can go and do stuff. It's like he shows up at Wano to stop Green Bull so Luffy can kind of not deal with that. It's just like, that's what Shanks' role is now. Kizaru is about ready to fl fly after the Straw Hats, and then that's when Ben Beckman shows up, and he's just like, don't move, Kizaru. <laughs> he can say that without moving his lips, remember? And so he's like, oh, Ben Beckman, okay, we've I've been through this song and dance before. I know where it's at. That might be a running gag between Ben Beckman and Kizaru. He, like, holds a gun up to Kizaru's face. This has happened multiple times, not just at Marineford. It's like it's like a game to them at that point. It's like, oh, boy, Ben, it's like a, it's like, oh, you're, you're, you're playing the old Ben Beckman rifle shooty at Kizaru. Oh, I know this game pretty well. All right, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> Shanks is like, let Luffy go. He has to make his adventure happen. All right, so no, I, I don't think Shanks is going to show up. But Blackbeard is his presence on Egghead has already been established. Like one of his ships was there. It's most likely Katarina, Davon, and Lafitte because those are the only two that are unaccounted for. But with the timelines and stuff, it could be Blackbeard himself. You know what I mean? And then we have light versus darkness, very literally, and in, in every sense that you can imagine. So we'll we'll see where that rolls. Okay, but yeah, keys are is uh, currently at Egghead, and he's uh, dealing with the soul situation with the Vegapunks and the Straw Hats. Okay, so uh, let's do Akainu next. Let's do Akainu next. Okay, so Akainu was at Marijua to deal with the Kuma situation. Kuma scaling the red line, arriving at Marijua. They didn't really know what his goal was, so they just attacked him, because the, for all they know, that they're tr he's trying to, like, scale the castle and, you know, get in there and murder the Gorosei or whatever, or slaughter as many people in Tenerubito as possible. Clearly was not Kuma's mission, uh, because, you know, when he got into the city, yeah, he did use an Ursus of Shock, but that was because, like, the guards, the pinheaded guards were trying to hold him down, and he's a man on a mission. I mean, he's more of a robot right now, but he's a robot man Terminator on a mission, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it's like, my prime directive is to find my daughter and tell her I love her and give her her birthday present. You know, he's like, I am so sorry, Bonnie, I've missed so many Christmases. Do they have Christmas in the One Piece world? I know. Video for another day. Um, but no, so he's charging through Marijua, and I, because I think it's been like a couple hours for him to get up the red line, they put in a call to their guard dog, who is a Kainu. He shows up, fights against Kuma, melts part of his foot off, half of his face gets, you know, singed off completely with um, his Magamagu no Mi, and so eventually Kuma just pops out of there, heading into the new world, most likely to Egghead Island. So what's a Kainu going to be up to then? Uh, I think while... Things are still on red alert. He's going to hang out in Marijua for a little while here. Um, is that going to be relevant to anything? Well, if the revolutionaries decide to make their move, eh, it could be. It could definitely be. If it's like a situation where they're like, all right, like, like Kong comes out or something, and Kong is like, all right, good job, Akainu. Good job, Sakazuki, for stopping that rampaging robot. And he's like, that's, oddly enough, that's the second time a giant robot has scaled the red line and has attacked Marijua. You know, it's, it's weird. It hasn't happened a lot, but it's happened more often than you'd think. If I had some nickels for that, you know, anywho, um, maybe you should just hang out here. We go back to my office, have some tea, and just chill, because we don't really know if it's like the red alert has lowered yet. Also, especially with the revolutionaries attacking the place and burning down the granaries and everything. Maybe maybe we should, the food reserves, maybe we should hang out here for a little while. So, um, Sakazuki, as the fleet admiral, is most often positioned or stationed at Marine HQ. And he doesn't really leave, just like how, you know, Sengoku never really left. He usually went from Marine HQ to Marijua for, like, meetings and stuff. Um, but Sengoku was not out there in the world actively hunting pirates. That's not what the fleet admiral does. So, Akainu's probably just gonna sit tight in Marijua 
and some stuff might get involved with the revolutionaries if that they're moving now. I mean, Dragon stuff's happening, okay? Like, Kuma left, and he's like, all right, well, you know, this is happening, okay? People all over the world are are, are raising the revolutionary flag, and they're rebelling against their corrupt kings, and, and we've already declared war on the, um, the, the Tenrubito. So, the, like, if the revolution's gonna happen, I mean, it kind of already is, but, like, if the big revolution's going to happen, like, obviously there's all these different kingdoms that are rebelling all over the world, but if the big revolution is going to happen, it's got to be sooner rather than later. You can't just like, all right, we attacked Marijua and destroyed all their food reserves. Now, the next plan of the revolution, wait six months and then attack again. They'll never see it coming. No, Dragon's going to be moving, okay? And, and, you know, if you might be thinking like, oh, well, they're going to have to go all the way back up the red line to go back into Marijua, that really won't take all that long, okay? You got Karasu's ability uh, to transform into Soot to basically make himself like a murder of crows to fly back up there. You got Morley's ability, um, the push-push fruit to basically just scale the entire red line just like, whoop, like really quickly with Morley's power. Um, Bello's, Be Bello Betty's ability to rally all of the masses together. Like, you could build an army like that. Um, Dragon Dragon's power, which is either a Logia to control the wind, or a Paramecia to control the weather, or maybe a Logia to control the weather in general, or since we're going with mythical zones a lot, a mythical zone that has the ability to control the weather. I don't know. Well, there are a lot of mythological creatures that can manipulate the weather. He's just like the Izan, uh, no, 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 not Izanami. I guess it would be Susano. Susano was the storm god. So the Susano mythical zone. Why not, right? Hito Hito no Mi model Susano, okay? Well, point is, Dragon and his commanders, Ivankov, everybody, can get up to the Marijua. It wouldn't take very long, okay? So if they're doing that, they get all the way up there, and they don't expect uh, Sakazuki to be right there by the front gate. Sakazuki is the guard dog by the front gate. So it might be a thing where it's like, all right, that was not part of the plan, but it's okay. So Dragon steps up, and he might be like, all right, you guys go ahead. Bello Betty, Morley, Karasu, Ivankov, Inazuma, you guys all go on ahead. I'll take care of this guy. And then we have Dragon versus Akainu. Or other option, you could just have Sabo fight Akainu. That could work, because when you look at the strength of the Revolutionary Army, like, they're powerful, sure. Dragon is objectively the strongest, like, clearly, right? I mean, he has the ability to control the damn weather, right? So, it's like Akainu, Kong, the God's Knights, plus the Gorosei, plus Eam. Uh, maybe, maybe Dragon wouldn't even be the one to deal with Akainu. Maybe it would be Sabo. That would actually be a lot more poetic, because, you know, obviously Akainu's the one that killed Ace. So, we could have Sabo deal with Akainu, and maybe, I, I want, there's a, something I want to happen with that fight, if that ever does happen, which I think is very likely it will. I want, because the whole way that um, Akainu was able to kill Ace was like, oh, you have the power of the Mara Mara Nomi, you have the power of fire. However, magma burns hotter than fire, so I can just punch right through you and I can kill you that way, right? It's like the superior devil fruit. I want Sabo's Mara Mara to be even hotter than Ace's. I want his ability to get so hot that it's just like, oh, I've made fire that burns hotter than even magma. And then boom. And in real life, fire can get hotter than magma. Magma is like at around, I think, a thousand degrees. Fire can definitely get hotter. We've like looked into the science behind this. So um, I would want like Sabo to go like blue fire or like white hot fire or whatever and just burn right through a Kainu in like a reverse of the same thing that happened with Ace. Okay. So we could have Sabo. Sabo dealing with Akainu, um, which might be insane to some people, but I think it's as much as ridiculous as, not, not ridiculous, but it makes as much sense as Luffy currently fighting Kizaru, and then you have, you know, um, Sabo currently fighting Akainu, if that happens, and then maybe Dragon can move forward to deal with Kong, who's the former fleet admiral, who's also pretty tough, and then the commanders, can, the commanders are gonna have to deal with the God's Knights. Sabo and, and Dragon can't deal with, like, Kong, Akainu, all the God's Knights, all the Gorose, like, they're gonna have to divvy this up, okay? Karasu's gonna have to deal with one of the God's Knights, Morley, and, like, the God's Knights are gonna be... I mean, they have the vice commanders of the revolution, but, like, how is this going to really shake down? This this seems to be getting into another video for another day kind of territory, so I'll, I'll put a pin in it right there on exactly how how the revolution's going to deal with this threat, because it seems like they're a little outnumbered in terms of overall power, um, you know, with uh, everybody that's at Marijua. But uh, that's up with Akainu right now, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. But uh, anyway, that's what's up with Akainu right now, what I guess could happen with Akainu. Uh, I'm realizing this is turning into more headcanon than anything, but uh, we have to expand upon this. A little bit. We can't just be like, Kizru's at Egghead, Akainu's at Marijua, Aokiji's at Hachinosu, Fujitora's somewhere in the ocean, and uh, Aramaki is currently bringing in uh, Weevil. 
It's like, okay, there you go. There's the video right there. That could be a YouTube short, to be honest with you. But no. Moving on to Aokiji now, or Kuzon, because he's discarded the title of Aokiji. I shouldn't even be talking about him right here. He's not even an admiral anymore. He abandoned his post. How could you, Aokiji? How could you? The Marines were such a noble organization that always strived for justice and equality, and you had to you had to leave them to fight for Blackbeard. Um, so he's currently on a Hachi no soon. He just uh, you know fought and managed to subdue Garp. You don't really kill Garp. You don't really defeat Garp. You just kind of like maybe contain him for a certain amount of time. He's like an eldritch god. He's like Cthulhu. You know, you, even if you even if you physically destroyed every atom of Garp, he's gonna reconstitute in like a century or something like that. You know, you really can't get rid of them, you, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, so they had the big rescue operation, of course, to, you know, rescue Kobe and all the other slaves that were currently on the island. We had this big force of sword. We had uh, Prince Groose. We had Kujaku, who was the granddaughter of Suru. We had uh, Hibari, who may or may not be the daughter of Akainu. Kind of hope she is. Um, we have all this stuff going on, and it ends with, um, I mean, overall, I would say a success. I mean, Garp would have 100% considered it a success because Garp's thing is like, you're the young Marines, you're carrying the torch, the next generation, right? My time is, is pretty much over. I'm just going to bow out. I'm going to teach and educate and instruct the newer generation, but when it's my time to go, it's my time to go, okay? And so he would have 100%, and that's why last time we saw Garp, he was just laughing on the ground as he was finally being frozen by Aokiji, okay? And so we also found out a lot about Aokiji's, like, how he joined the Blackbeard crew or how he became an ally of them. And you know what? I love the way that Oda did that. I, 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 you know, everybody's always thinking like, oh, he's secretly a member of S.W.O.R.D. or he's do, he's working with the revolutions behind the scene, the revolutionaries and everything like that. But at the end of the day, I, I really like the idea that Aokiji's like, no, he just decided to join Blackbeard for his own merits. And it doesn't, it, it makes sense. It, it's not like something that's ridiculous, you know what I mean? Like, like, why would Aokiji have any reason to hate Blackbeard? Like, what has Blackbeard personally done to Aokiji that'd be like, I'll never join you. So Blackbeard, you know, he killed Whitebeard, he killed Ace, or, well, not killed Ace, but he led to Ace's capture, which eventually led to his execution. What the hell does Kuzon care about that? Whitebeard was a pirate. Ace was a pirate. The whole reason they gathered at Marineford was to kill Ace to begin with, so it's like, why would Kuzon be mad at the guy that brought him in? Now, yeah, Blackbeard did, you know, you know, betray the Marines ultimately, and, you know, he got in there and everything like that, and he discarded the title of Warlord just to use that for his own devices, but Kuzon also defected. He also left, and he was like, I don't think Kuzon was ever a fan of the Warlord system to begin with, so it's just like, yeah, the Warlord system, it's kind of broken. You know, Fujitora, that was more for Fujitora's thing, but I don't think Kuzon was 100% on board with it either. So, um, yeah, I mean, Blackbeard, you know, he's going around hunting a lot of, you know, Devil Fruit users and things like that. Um, they're not really killing Marines, though. I mean, I'm sure they probably are, but that's more of the cross guilds thing. I, so I, I just don't see any personal reason why Kuzon would look at Blackbeard and be like, you know, I'll never join you, you're evil, you know? Now, I mean, from an ultimate, you know, meta perspective, you know, Blackbeard is literally the dude that harnesses the power of darkness in his soul. So maybe you'd be like, ah, you're kind of the villain. But like, from the storyline, you know, path, it's like, okay, um, and Blackbeard explained it, Teach explained it to Kuzon, like, hey man, we're just a, we're, hold on, <laughs> you know, we're just a bunch of guys hanging out, you know, having a good time, uh, you know, doing our own, we have our own goals and ambitions, it's just working together is how we achieve those ambitions, you know, it's a better chance of us working together. So, you know, Kuzon, join my crew, become my Nakama, you know, we have a nice slot in the ten Titanic captains, you know, the nine Titanic captains just don't fit as much, ten is a, ten is a strong number. Aizen had the Espada and we can have you, you know? And so Kuzan is there and he's just like, yeah, alright, that, you know, because he's kind of tired of, and Teach even said, you know, aren't you tired of listening to, like, orders and, like, uh, you know, there was a whole hierarchy and structure of the Marines, like, aren't you, aren't you done with that? Don't you just want to be your own man? You know, come and work for me. You know, and you can pretty much, you know, pursue your own goals and stuff, okay? Now, you will be part of my crew, so there's some loyalty there, but it's a hell of a lot more freedom than you ever had working on the Marines, right? Being an admiral, especially, when you were directly under the thumb of the Tenerubito, right? And so, um, yeah, Aokiji decided to join him, and he was just like, I have a little bit of respect for, for Teach, and I have some loyalty to him, you know, because he kind of showed me the path. Now, 
Kuzan has changed his direction a lot of times in his life. He used to subscribe to Burning Justice, and then it was Lazy Justice. I, I think it's actually a different kind of justice that he has now. It's like personal justice for Kuzan, you know what I mean? So um, I don't think this is going to be a situation where, y y you know, like... Um, like Kobe goes up to Kuzan or something and Kobe is just like, Kuzan, you, he, he's betraying you. He's manipulating you. You need to come back to the Marines. And Kuzan might just be like, Kobe, Kobe, Kobe. I like you, kid. I do. But it's like, you just don't get it. All right. You be in the Marines for like 30, 40 years, kid. And then you tell me how you feel about this organization, all right? Maybe your generation will be the ones to change it. Maybe you kids will be the one to, to reform the Marines and everything to make it a more honorable uh, uh, organization that's actually about justice, my kind of justice. But uh, until then... I'm, I'm hanging out with Blackbeard here, okay? You know, plus they got a full bar on tap. It's great. Fantastic, okay? So, you know, if, if Kobe and, like, Kuzan ever had that interaction, because, you know, Kobe is somebody that's, like, a little bit more... A little bit more naive, you know, because he's he's a brand new Marine. I mean, yeah, he's a captain, sure, but he's only been in the Marines for two years. He's uh, 18 years old, and he's just like, you know, oh, the Marines, justice, you know, and the older Marines are probably a little bit more jaded about that, where they kind of realize what the Marines are really about, and, it, and you kind of become somebody like Kuzan who decides to leave because of that, or you become someone like a Kainu that becomes just locked in their own life, you know, trapped in their like this this position of authority that doesn't really have a lot of authority. Uh, or do you become like Kizaru, who kind of sort of becomes numb to it all, where he's just like, oh, well, I'm just a cog in the machine. They point, I fire my laser, and that's how it is. So it's actually, you could actually do like a whole psychological breakdown of the three original admirals and how they ended up where they ended up and their personal philosophy on coming to terms, like like their justification for being in the Marines after seeing all, because like Kizaru, Akainu, uh, and Akiji, they knew everything about what was happening behind the scenes. Maybe not everything, everything. They didn't know about Eam or anything, but they knew about the corruption of the world government. They understood the hypocrisy of being all for justice when the Tenerbito have slaves. It's like, yeah, you have justice branded on the back of your coats, but slavery is still a thing. And the people that are like, it's not like you're fighting against slavery. You're actively helping. You're the military arm of the world government that supports slavery, for God's sakes. In fact, this is the messed up thing. If one of the Tenerubito, if, like, one of their slaves, you know, escapes and, like, you know, one of the slaves picks up a, a metal rod and, like, smacks one of the Tenerubito in the face, an admiral has to show up. A symbol of justice has to show up to kill the slave. So, you know, like, the justification that the admirals, the hoops they have to go through internally to, like, why are we still here working for these people? It's tough. And so Kuzan was just like, I'm out of here. I'm done. You know, there was a lot of final straws with that. But, yeah, he's done. So he's currently at Hachinosu. I think he's going to stick He's gonna stick close to that place to um, guard Garp. He's not going to let Garp out of his sight. Because even after you freeze Garp in, like, cryogenic suspension at, like, absolute zero temperatures, you don't want to take your eyes off that guy, all right? So that, that'll be how it goes there. That's, that's where Aokiji's currently at. Um, Green Bull. Let's do Green Bull next. I think we saw him right before that. It's been a while since we've seen Fujitora. I actually had to look up where he was at. But anyway, so Green Bull. We saw him at Wano, where he showed up there. He was trying to, like, grab, a, you know, a present in, in the form of, like, Luffy. He's like, I'll bring back Luffy's head for a Kainu, because uh, Aramaki, uh, Ryo, um, I always, you know what? It's the one admiral name I'm not great at pronouncing. Ryo Kugyu. It's Ryo Kugyu, right? So I usually just say Aramaki or Green Bull. But anyway, so he's like, oh, I'm going to go to Wano, get Luffy's head, bring him back to Akainu, because he's an Akainu fanboy. That's the kind of like part of the reason why he joined the Marines. He looks up to Akainu, and I would say, I would argue, and I always say this, that he's actually more dangerous than Akainu is, just because he's not, like, like Akainu is who he is. You know, that's his personality, and that's the guy he is, but Aramaki is sort of like, my personality is to impress Akainu. He might go overboard to the point where it's like, you know, uh, Green Bull does something that even a Kainu would be like, whoa, okay, cool down, buddy. I know, I know I'm the one saying that, but like, calm down. You're going way overboard with this. You know, I appreciate the effort, but 
but maybe dial it down a notch, you know, a little bit, okay? So I, I think he's way more dangerous. So he was at Wano, he fought against the Scabbards and Momonosuke uh, briefly, and then Shanks showed up, made him shit his pants, that's canon, and then he decided to skip out, right? And so after that, immediately, it seemed like he headed to Sphinx, because uh, Ratten, who was uh, maybe the cousin of Nezumi, uh, was attacking the village in Sphinx. You know, it's like, where is Whitebeard's treasure at? Another excuse for, I mean, another reason why the Marines are not, you know, all for justice and everything. So Weevil showed up to protect the village. You know, it's like, that's my dad's village. That's Whitebeard's village. And so he shows up and he defeats Ratten and wipes out a whole squad of Marines because he's Weevil and he's built tough. Um, however, they uh, do get a distress signal out and the first person to receive that distress signal as he was leaving. Uh, I, I would imagine as Aramaki is in the laundry room in his Marine vessel cleaning off his pants. It's just like, okay, Admiral Greenbull, we have your pants. They're cleaned. And just like, oh, damn that Shanks. And he's putting on his pants, and he's like, distress call from Sphinx. You know, an entire squad was wiped out. Edward Weevil's going crazy. And just like, all right, I can deal with Weevil. I can deal with that. He's like, Greenbull's like, I need to redeem myself a little bit here, okay? So he heads over there, and it's like no nonsense. He just completely wraps up Weevil, probably uh, starts to drain. It's like his ability, the Mori Mori no Mi, is really devastating. He was able to take down King and Queen at the prison. Granted, King and Queen were probably wearing sea stone cuffs, so they couldn't use their devil fruit powers, respectively. But still, being able to take him down, you know, without like, like zero effort on his part, that was a big deal. And then he probably like maybe drained some of the uh, life force or the nutrients from Weevil so maybe Weevil got all shriveled up or something and he uh, carted him off so he was able to defeat him yeah, you know that Weevil wouldn't have really thought about this tactically or anything like that, or like, what is his Devil Fruit power? Does he know hockey? How good is, is his hockey? No, it would have just been Weevil looking right at Green Bull and like, you're gonna hurt Papa's village! Oh! And he's just gonna charge right at Green Bull. If Green Bull would have let him reach him, which probably not, he would just, you know, created a bunch of vines and stuff to grab Weevil and just drag him down. And like, wow, that was easy. Dude ran right for me like an idiot. Or he could have let Weevil get close to him and just like, ugh, and swing the Bicento, slice Green Bull in half. But oops, it was just a wood clone. You know, Hashirama sends you with this shit. And then he just shows up behind Weevil and be like, oh, that was... Easier than I expected. Whoosh! And then just stab Weevil from like a hundred different directions and just suck out his nutrients, trap him, and cart him off. I don't think it would have been very difficult for, for Green Bull to bring Weevil in. Now, where's Green Bull heading is the thing. Is he heading to go and give Weevil to the, you know, like Impel Down or something? Because I don't think going all the way back to Paradise is really going to work here. Or he's like, okay. I couldn't get my hands on Straw Hat to show Akainu, but I'm going to show him Weevil. So he's like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty capable, Akainu. Check it out. I took out one of the warlords, one of the ex-warlords, single-handedly. And this guy says he's the son of Whitebeard. I'm pretty awesome, right? Oh, please love me, Akainu. I want your respect. I want your acknowledgement, Akainu. Please. You know? And where's Akainu at right now? Marijua. So Green Bull might be heading there, actually. Ooh, and then... Weevil might end up in Marijuana, and if he gets freed, he might help the revolution? Uh, oh my god! It's, it's, you see how the pieces are falling in place. I could see how the pieces are falling in place. Yes, indeed. But yeah, um, Green Bull has Weevil, and uh, also Marco might be organizing a rescue operation with Miss Bucking, uh, Miss Buckingham, you know, uh, and so might be like, all right, well, I can't help you because I got to stay here and guard the village. You saw what happened when I left last time. But, you know, Marco knows some people. He has connections. He might make a call to like, hey... Jozu, Vista, time to get the band back together. Might be something like that, and they might form a strike team. And then we have the former Whitebeard crew going after Weevil, who's in the possession of Green Bull, who might be at Marijua, where the revolution's taking place, and then boom, then Whitebeard's crew show up to help everybody. Vista versus one of the God's Knights. Vista versus Shanks' hot sister. Okay, lock it in. Let's do that. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, and now last but certainly not least of the Admirals, we have Admiral Fujitora. Isho, the proponent of blind justice. I mean, humane justice, who is also blind. Yes, okay. So, uh, Fujitora, I actually did have to look up where he was at right now, because I honestly did not remember. Um, we, we saw him uh, during Wano, like in between, I think, Acts uh, 2 and 3. Uh, it was the same chapter, actually, where Sengoku was explaining rocks to all the other Marines. Uh, we see Isho on his ship, and he's kind of sailing around. And yeah, by the way, on the sails of Isho's personal vessel, it says, uh, for life. You know, like, he's like, I fight for life! Humanity and altruism 
and all that kind of stuff, right? So um, he's a good guy. He's a genuinely good guy. Like, out of all of the admirals, I would say even more so than Aokiji. Um, it would probably go Fujitora, then Aokiji, like the most moral admirals that are, like, actually seeing this for what it is and, like, okay, I don't agree with this and I'm actually going to try to actively, um, you know, uh, step in the way of the government's, you know, oppressiveness all over the world, right? So we saw him there. He was sailing. This was after Reverie, and he was kind of sailing and having a conversation uh, with Sakazuki and just talking about, like, the current events at Wano, like Big Mom and Kaido joining forces and, like, oh, Rox has returned and everything like that. Uh, he was on his ship eating when uh, some Sea Kings were attacking, and so they were just, like, launching at Sea Kings, like, fighting back and whatever. But uh, we find out some stuff later that happened during Reverie, okay? So during the Reverie, Fujitora and Green Bull were present. We even see them there, you know, enjoying a meal together before things really got intense um, but after things did get live and the revolutionaries were attacking the city like Morley and Karasu and everybody like that they obviously fought you know against the revolutionaries you know against the commanders however a big thing that happened that we find out was that the revolutionaries their, their main goal of course was not just you know they had a, they had a lot of main goals they had to destroy the symbol and um, the food reserves but another big one was free as many slaves as possible and then like Sabo's personal one was we, we need to free Kuma it has to be Kuma. We got to get Kuma out of here, okay? But like freeing as many slaves as possible from the from the Holy Land, that was one of the main goals, okay? So I would imagine as soon as the revolutionaries make themselves known, which I imagine like they would pop out and Sabo would like throw a giant fireball at the celestial dragon symbol in the city and just blow that up immediately. Um, then the, the admirals are going to mobilize and it's like, okay, Green Bull and Fujitora, go, 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 fight the revolutionaries. They're, they're attacking the city, whatever. The Tenrubito are in danger. So, you know, Green Bull is obviously going to jump right in and be like, oh, here we go. Now, it was a little bit complicated even for Green Bull, though, because the city was, like, where all the Tenrubito live, and they don't want to damage it too much, and so he was kind of limited by what he could really do with his Mori Mori powers. Um, so he fought against Morley, and Morley was able to actually hold, you know, Green Bull off pretty well there. Um, and then you had Fujitora, who did fight against them, but after he began to realize, like, okay... Yeah, you, you blew up the Celestial Dragon symbol, which, you know, Fujitora doesn't give a shit about that. Oh no, you blew up the symbol of all of these pieces of crap that, you know, enslave others. It's like, okay, Fujitora doesn't care about that. And then the food reserves, it's like, okay, you know, that's maybe a concern. But then... They're freeing all the slaves, you know, like, you know, like uh, Karasu's going around, Lindbergh's using his powers and everything, like all of his inventions and stuff. They're freeing the slaves. Karasu's letting everybody go and get out. It's like, go, 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 get out of here. And so Fujitora sees that and he's like, yeah, I'm not going to stop them. Like, I'm just not. Okay, like, I'm, I'm not, I don't like slavery. I don't think it should be a thing. I'm not, I'm going to actively help them escape. And so he does. So Green Bull got pissed off. And started to attack, and the two fought. Now, this was something that was, like, off-panel. Uh, we only get to see, like, one flashback of it, like, during when... I think it was, um... I think it was, like, Kobe. Not Kobe, but it was, like, one of the Marines when they were heading to Hachinosu. Like, they mentioned, like, oh, yeah, you know, Green Bull got awfully sore at Fujitora, and then they fought. And it was just that they went at it, you know what I mean? It was just one little panel where we saw them, like, staring at each other, and that's it. But, dude, that would have been a fun fight to see. Fujitora brawling with, like, Green Bull to, like, okay, you know, use, like, revolutionaries. I don't don't agree with everything you're all about and all that stuff, but if you're freeing the slaves, I'm gonna be your ally here, okay? So he allowed them to get away, and Fujitora is still an admiral. He's still an admiral. He still has his ship. He has his men that listen to him. And uh, I think he's going to be a big proponent for this revolution as well. You know, I mean, I'm going a lot of headcanon here, but like, really, it just makes perfect sense that Fujitora would be the closest ally that the um, revolutionaries have in the Marines. I mean, honestly, I mean, there's other people like Smoker, too, and Tashigi and Sword in general. But like, Fujitora is kind of their guy, you know, because he's the one that recently joined the Marines. He wasn't around for he wasn't like decades and decades of this. And, you know, he is blinded and he can kind of like sense people's auras with his observation hockey he's a much better judge of character and so he realizes the whole situation as it stands and he's like yeah i think fujitora has already made up his mind on where he where he sits and what he's going to do i think if it kills him fujitora is going to try to bring down the tenorubito
on that system, free all the slaves, and try to make it an organization that he could be uh, proud of. Uh, even if he has to, even if he doesn't live very long to see it, he's still gonna do it because that's the kind of guy Fujitora is, a hundred and ten percent. Okay. So last time we saw him, I guess in the in the continuity of the story, after Reverie, he was on the ship. He had some wounds from the fight, uh, which might have been actually more of Green Bull's injuries than uh, rather than him fighting the revolutionaries directly. Um, so it might be like he's on his ship, he's heading out. They were fighting a Sea King, but that's not a big deal. I mean, Fujitora could like snap his fingers and like crush a Sea King like that. So we don't really know where they were headed. Uh, they were him and Sakazuki were having the conversation about the warlords being abolished, and he's like, "Well, you know, Fujitora says, you know, the SSG, we're just gonna have to leave faith in them." But the SSG is also a problem because Vegapunk's being threatened, and you know, Fujitora is not gonna be a fan of that. So you know what? Okay, roll back a little bit. When I was talking about Kizaru earlier, I said, okay, what could what could encumber Kizaru to the point where he doesn't chase after the Straw Hats? Because even if the Straw Hats blast away, they can blast away at Mach 1 on a giant rocket. Kizaru could still follow them. Well, like I said, you know, if another Yonko shows up, that would be a threat. If uh, St. J. Garcia Saturn was threatened, that would be a, a reason for him to stick around, right? Another Admiral showing up, that could be a thing. Because then we have Fujitora arriving. Because we he's kind of MIA right now. He could kind of show up anywhere. He could show up at uh, Marijuana. That would make sense. He could show up at Egghead. That would make sense. We don't know where he's heading or what he's what he's doing. So Fujitora shows up and stops Kizaru and says, I'm not going to let you chase after the Straw Hats, and I'm not going to let you kill Vegapunk. You know, I'm, the whole reason I wanted to abolish the Warlords, because the Warlords is a corrupt system, and I was putting my faith in Vegapunk, who Fujitora clearly, like, agrees with Vegapunk, you know, his uh, ideals and stuff like that. So it's like, cool, give the job to Vegapunk. He can do it with the, you know, the Seraphim and the SSG, and now you're trying to kill Vegapunk and, and co-opt his, his robots for, like, your own machinations. Fujitora's probably like, screw this. I'm not letting you fight them. I already fought one Admiral Kizaru. I fought Green Bull. I could fight you. Let's go. All right. I'm not letting you chase after them. And then very much like how we can have darkness versus light with Blackbeard and Kizaru. Now we have gravity versus light. And I am not, I do not know enough about physics or quantum physics to understand how that would work. I'm sure Oda doesn't have a freaking doctorate in physics either. So we're just going to see where that goes. Um, I'm just going to, you know what? I'm going to do a quick Google search because I just have it pulled up. How does gravity affect light? All right, let's 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 see where this goes. First result here, okay. Something from PBS. Gravity bends the path of light. That fact is guaranteed by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Oh, also, yeah, gravity, light, Einstein, Vegapunk. Yeah, I think Fujitora is going to show up at Egghead. I think I stumbled upon something here. I think this is going to make sense here. I think this, this is going to work. Um... Photons have no mass, but they are nonetheless affected by gravity. How does that work? Once again, not a physicist. <laughs> There's a lot of physicists out there right now like, oh boy, Jackie, you're, you're digging up stuff that you, okay. It's like, we don't know. Is that one of those things like, we just don't know. They have no mass, but they're still affected by gravity. We don't know how, it's just they are. That's one of the biggest mysteries of the, of the universe you've just stumbled upon. There you go. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, Fujitora versus Kizaru. Let's roll with that. Let's roll with that. All right, well, that's the video. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, that was a really fun one, just to talk about. Not so much, I was going to do it just on where the admirals are, but then that just exploded into all my different, like, ideas on what they could be doing next. So there we are, that's something. Uh, we are now entering the final installment of Yellow Jacket Facts, and I am very, very happy for that. One, because we're almost done with animal facts in general. You know, people have been saying to me, oh, man, we should go to plant facts next, like pineapples. I'm like, no, no, we're not. We should do insect facts. No, we're done. I might bring it back eventually in the future, but we're done for a while, all right? This is literally a joke I started on a whim that has gone on for two and a half years, and I'm almost done with this. <laughs> Okay, so we have one and also just because I'm done talking about yellow jackets because they freak me out But yeah, we're gonna do one more yellow jacket facts and then we're gonna move on to zebras because they have to be zebras We're gonna talk about zebras also maybe zorses a bit and uh, and then and then that's it. We're done Okay, we're done for the foreseeable future. Okay hit the intro go All right, today we're talking about yellow jacket nests. 
and uh, they can get pretty big. So, uh, like, I, like I said, a lot of the uh, wasp species make their nests out of paper, which, technically speaking, they are all, like, paper wasps. I mean, there's another species that's generally considered a paper wasp that looks very different from a yellow jacket. They have a more, like, orange kind of complexion rather than the yellow jackets black and uh, yellow. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, yellow jackets will make some of their nests in the ground. There's certain species that'll make ground hives, but then there are a lot of species that will make it, you know, in the, uh, on, like, uh, under a tree or under a like an overhang I had one underneath my gutters in my uh, back porch not long ago I had to wipe out so um they range, you know, they start off pretty tiny. Uh, it's uh, the foundress, that's the term for the queen uh, yellow jacket that emerges from the winter, and she's the one that starts everything, kind of gets everything going. So uh, she's called the foundress, so she will found the uh, the nest and begin to build it. So they will consume wood particles or wood matter and then mix it with their saliva and then spit it back up, and that's what creates that, like, paper kind of substance. If you've ever actually found, like, um, like an old nest, and I, I actually did have one, like, up on my um, shelf not a while ago. I, I eventually threw it away, but you know, you find like a uh, nest and you can kind of pull it down and if it like maintains its shape, it's a very very coarse, papery, very thin substance, but it, it maintains its shape really well for their purposes. Um, of course, hexagons are the best of gone, so they make their little hexagon spaces to lay their eggs in for their larvae and the grubs and everything like that. But some of these nests, man, can grow to gargantuan size. Larger kind of nest here, now a really big nest, and it's like, oh god! Oh my god, quit showing me these. This is one that was in a woman's guest bedroom in England. Like, this woman had a guest bedroom, I guess. I guess she left her door or window open at some point, and some bees, or not bees, they're not bees, wasps came in and laid a whole nest, and then this happened. It's just, like, God, I've seen examples of, like, old abandoned cars, and then they'll get in there and just, like, cover the entire car. I mean, these things can build, like, thousands and thousands and thousands strong. Now, this isn't super common, but on the outliers, when this does happen, it's absolutely insane, and terrifying and I'm just gonna stop talking about the yellow jackets now because it's it, yeah it's causing me anxiety all right well anyway that was the last episode of yellow jacket facts tune in next time for zebra facts and then we're done we're done <laughs> okay oh my god okay uh thanks for watching everybody tech exciting out later